Uh, good, good evening, members, uh, and good evening to members of the public uh, who may be watching this meeting, this meeting uh, online, uh, and welcome to the officers who are present as well. Um, this is our first live meeting uh, of the Audit and Governance Committee since the beginning of last year. Could I just check that everybody is entirely comfortable with the arrangements before we begin? Thank you very much indeed. Um, so without uh, further ado, I'll pass over to Louise Smith, uh, Democratic Services Officer, uh, to deal with the housekeeping issues. Ms Smith. Thank you, Chairman. Please note that this meeting of the Audience and Audit and Governance Committee is being recorded by the Council for live broadcast and will be published on the Council website for a minimum of six months. The meeting may also be recorded or streamed for live or subsequent broadcasts by members of the public, although ultimate discretion in this matter lies with the Chairman. Please could everyone present follow these ground rules. Only speak when invited to by the Chairman. Ac if accessing via Teams, only to always turn on your video function when invited to speak and state your name. Please use your microphones when speaking and please mute or turn off your microphone when you are not talking. If accessing via Teams, please use the raise hand feature if you would, at the top of the bar if you would like to speak. And if a vote is required, unless in relation to agendas items three and four, then the Democratic Services Officer will call out each committee number, member's name in turn, starting with the chairman and vice chairman. Please respond with for, against or abstain. For those in the room, please note that if a fire alarm sounds, please exit the building by way of the nearest available signed exit route and make your way to the ground floor of the multi-storey car park. Finally, please ensure background noise is kept to a minimum and mobile phones and other devices are switched off or turned to silent for the duration of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Smith. Uh, could I ask you please to take items one and two on the agenda? Yes, Chairman. There are no apologies for absence and therefore no substitutes. Thank you very much. Uh, for item three on the agenda, I shall defer to the Vice Chairman. Vice Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, this is the time of the year we need to uh, re-elect or elect the Chairman. Um, are there any nominations? Yes. Councillor Phil. Thank you, Vice Chair. I'd like to nominate Councillor John Beasley for the position of Chair. We have a second. Thank you. Uh, those in favour? Oh, oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Are there any other nominations? Uh, I think by default you're re-elected chairman. Chairman. Uh, well, thank you very much indeed, members, and um, I should do my very best uh, during the coming year uh, to serve the purposes of the Audit and Governance Committee uh, and to ensure that um, the, the progress that we, I think, have made over the last year uh, is continued, both on on this and indeed the constitutional issues which we're dealing with separately. But uh, thank you for your support uh, and, and the way in which you helped me to conduct the meetings. It takes us on to item four on the agenda, which is the election of Vice Chairman of the Audit and Governance Committee. Are there any nominations? Councillor Anne Filer, seconder. Um, I'd like to propose Councillor Lawrence Williams as Vice Chairman. Thank you very much. And uh, seconder? Uh, yes, I'll second that, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Fear. Are there any other nominations? Uh, there are no other nominations. In that case, uh, Councillor Williams, you are re-elected as the Vice Chairman. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you to members. Um, item five on the agenda. Uh, declarations of interest. Do any councillors have disclosable pecuniary interests or any local interests on any item on the agenda? Um, I, don't know, I don't know if it is a um, pecuniary, but I remember in the National Trust. Um, I checked in advance. Um, it's for the Parks uh, Foundation piece that we're doing presently. I checked with um, officers earlier and it isn't a declarable interest. Um, I'm, sure, also, I'm sure that others in the room may be members as well. May also say that I'm a member of the Lower Gardens Trust. Uh, I would ask uh, Ms Smith if you could um, record that declaration. If there are no other uh, declarations of interest, um, 
Item six on the agenda is confirmation of the minutes of the meeting held on the 22nd of April 2021. Um, are you agreed that those are a true and accurate record uh, of the meeting? Thank you very much. In that case, I shall sign them. Um, item seven on the agenda, uh, public issues, Ms Smith? There have been no public issues received, Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, in that case, we can get on with the uh, substantive item uh, on this uh, meeting, which is the governance arrangements around public parks. Uh, by way of introduction, um, I've uh, discussed this uh, uh, with the chair of the overview and scrutiny um, board uh, in terms of making sure that we look at uh, the governance arrangements. Uh, there have been a, a number of uh, issues raised uh, which, uh, beginning with the three councils being brought together, um, have made it very clear, I think, that we have a number of trusts which are covered in this particular part of the council's activities. And it just seemed appropriate to make sure that the governance arrangements were clearly understood by members of this committee, uh, but also to uh, ask questions of officers in case any of it is unclear and to see whether out of that there are any issues which we think uh, need to be taken forward. Um, so this evening uh, we have... Sorry, Sorry Councillor Phipps. Sorry. Um, I've just noticed in here that it says presentation content and one of the little dots is parish councils. Um, am I supposed to say that I'm chairman of a parish council? Sorry about that. Um, so could I declare that now? I'm Certainly, of course you can. <laughs> I'll ask Ms. I thought it was all about parts. I didn't. I obviously had a look at this, but I didn't cross my mind. It's at only the a very time. small part of the presentation. Yeah, I didn't cross Phipps, my, my mind at the time. You're quite right to to draw that to our attention. Um, could you speak a little louder because it's a bit muffled under the mask from this side? Apologies for being reluctant to take it off. I'm I'm somewhat paranoid about it, but I will do my very best. It's quite difficult. If you wouldn't mind, just when you're speaking. So to take us through uh, to the presentation uh, on the governance arrangements for public parks, um, this evening we have Ian Pultley, who's the Joint Unit Service Head from Environmental Services, and uh, Michael Rowland, who's the Strategic Lead for Green Space and Conservation. Um, and so the officers are going to take us through their presentation, and once they've done so, uh, members of the committee uh, are free to ask them questions on any issues relating uh, to the various parks issues which are being raised in the presentation. Gentlemen, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, members, um, Kate Langdown, who's the Director of Environment, um, sadly can't be with us this evening, but um, myself and Michael will um, hopefully get to see you through this subject as best as we can. In fact, Michael's going to present the um, the presentation um, for you this evening. Um, just before I, I, we start, I think it's probably worth pointing out that um, Michael will be so shortly leaving us. So if, if you have um, questions um, for, for us, um, particularly Michael, it would be good to get them um, in over the next couple of weeks. Um, and with that, Michael, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. I'll just try it to start sharing um, and I hope you can all see the screen now. Is that working OK? Yes, that's working, that's fine. Oh. OK, thank you, Councillor Beasley. OK, so I, I, I'm going to run through a little bit about um, the charitable aspects of, of parks. Um, Councillor Phipps, you manage parish councils. I bring that up really just as a, another way that um, parks are managed across BCP. So it's ju just for information really, um, but uh, clearly parish councils aren't charitable, but it's, it's, uh, it's a way that public parks can be managed um, within the conurbation outside of um, the local authority. So um, well, I was going to cover a little bit of an introduction to um, why we have some parks that um, are managed in trust and why we have um, some charities. Um, a little bit about the Parks Foundation, the Lower Gardens Trust, 
um, the Five Parks Trust, um, parish councils, other trusts, and, and then a chance for you to ask questions. So I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail, but I hope we can pick up um, pick up stuff as we go through. So um, it tends to be that where you find parks are, we have parks that are held in trust by a local authority. It's often um, due to a condition of a sale to the local authority or a bequest. So um, um, we'll cover that within the Lower Gardens Trust. But a lot of time is if a, if a landowner handed over a piece of land to the, the local authority at some point in the past, they would have put a covenant on it that it be used um, for, for the purposes of a public park in perpetuity. Um, and so that's one reason um, th that covers that second point is to maintain that purpose of um, um, recreational use. Um, there are financial reasons why some parks might be put into trust or spaces put into trust. So um, not so much within BCP, but um, around the rest of the country. So that there are benefits of, of having um, land held in trust. There are grants that local authorities um, are unable to access that trusts are um, or are more likely to access. Um, they can receive donations, gift aid um, and uh, charities receive um, uh, 80 percent uh, non-domestic rate um, reduction. So there are some benefits towards managing public space and trust. Um, there's transparent governance. So if you want something, if you if you don't want it run within the council, but you you still want that um, the transparent governance, that's that's done through the charities commission. Um, and there's also a public perception around it. So if you want people to um, to feel that something is is looked after properly in perpetuity, you want to engage people and and, and encourage more volunteering. Again, um, putting parts into trust it might be one reason to do that. So Lower Gardens Trust um, is a registered charity. Um, originally, the park was on, I think it was a 999 year lease from the America State. Um, I might be wrong with that, but it was certainly a very long lease from the America State. Um, and the council managed it uh, as a trust, but didn't have a board of trustees. For it, so it was still charitable land. Um, in 2011, the council obtained the freehold as part of a land swap. So the area that was the old tourist information centre in Bournemouth was given the the, the, the leasehold was surrendered and um, America State took the freehold of that land and um, developed it. Um, and in return, the council managed to take on the freehold of the lower gardens, which, um, which made the management of the gardens easier um, for the council. Um, but we were we needed to set up a charitable scheme for the council, so so for the for the gardens, and that has been set up. Um, the land within that trust also includes the the footprint of the Bournemouth Pavilion, um, and the, the objects of the charity are that decisions um, around that space must be taken for the furtherance of a charitable objects and not the wider interests of the council. So when you look at the charitable objects, it's basically to manage the park um, as a public pleasure ground um, as defined in the Public Health Acts. Um, any surplus funds that are generated from the lower gardens are to be reinvested in the space and the governance. So the trustees of that um, that charity have all all councillors um, within BCP now, but that governance is delegated to a board of um, trustees, which is made up of four councillors um, and three co-optees. And those co-optees are members of the public who apply um, to join the board. Um, and that board then um, the meets on uh, a regular basis, um, or is intended to meet on a regular basis, um, and makes decisions that are then recommended on to council uh, to cabinet and full council for uh, the management of that space and that's to ensure that when we're making decisions around the lower gardens they're made in in accordance with the charitable objects of the park as opposed to maybe uh, wider interests of the council so um, an example of that might be that it might be a council and I'm, I'm being hypothetical but if there was a, a council desire to put a um, develop something within the lower gardens that met some of our wider needs as a council but weren't necessarily beneficial to the park it's really important that the councils seem to be making decisions in the benefit of the park as opposed to those wider objectives of the council 
Um, the park's got an adopted master plan and management plan, um, and those have been through the, the board of um, trustees, um, and that helps officers um, in the day-to-day -day management of the park and gives them that delegated responsibility to manage the site. Another of our trusts within the Bournemouth area is the Five Parks Trust. Um, these are the former commons of Bournemouth. So after the enclosure awards, there were a number of commons left in Bournemouth. And um, early in the 20th century, the council bought out the remaining commoners' rights. Um, and the result of that was that um, we ended up with these parks held in trust. Um, it's called the Five Parks Trust. It's most of, but not all of, Merrick Park, Queen's Park, Kings Park, Red Hill Park and Seafield Gardens. Um, again, it's managed in a charitable scheme um, and we produce accounts for it. But in the case of the lower the five parks, we've never set up um, a separate board. So it's not managed consistently with, for example, um, the lower gardens or something like the Russell Coates. The Five Parks Act puts an upper limit on the amount of building we can put within those spaces, um, both individually and collectively across the, the land, um, and likewise with parking provision. Again, the trustees are the members of BCP Council, and again, decisions must be taken um, in the interests of the charitable objects, not, not the wider interests of the Council. Likewise, surplus funds, um, there's a theme here going back into the Trust. Um, the way we've managed uh, major decisions with um, the five parks is we tend to um, have in the past is have something like a, a cabinet or a, a portfolio holder decision um, and that would be titled uh, acting as in the interests of the trust. So it's very clear in that decision um, that that councillor um, and that is making that decision in the interest of trust and those are then those have then been advertised to all councillors. There's management plans in place for most of those sites. So Queen's Park, Seafield and Red Hill Park have all got management plans. Uh, we've got a draft uh, master plan and heritage significant assessment for Kings Park as well. Um, as a result of this land being held charitably, there was, there's was there been a, a, a lot of work done in the past um, within the Bournemouth area and that this resulted in, um, when we talk about those charitable objects, that, that park drives that had evolved into highways and then main roads, a decision was taken to close Kings Park Central Drive to vehicles in 1989 um, and later Merrick Park Drive closed in 2003. In both instances, the road was taken up if you to take any of the land out of one of those um, areas of trust, you have to replace it with a, a piece of land that's of the same size um, and adjoining the park as well. So th they're protected um, in perpetuity. So we've had a on the, the decisions around access, um, we've ended up taking attorney general advice um, and we had council's advice as well on on those sites there are other sites um, that are registered with the charity commission that bcp hold in trust um, we're working on understanding exactly where all these spaces are some of them um, were registered a long time ago and aren't particularly clear so if you look at this extract from the charity commission's website we've got one here that just says public open space or recreation ground there are a number of those within BCP, so we're working um, to try and understand exactly which spaces these are um, and we'll be able to, but in terms of the size of those spaces, um, we're not required at the moment to report back to the Charity Commission, so we're not being chased by the Charity Commission on those, but we will look further into exactly which spaces they are. Um, in terms of the Parks Foundation, the Parks Foundation doesn't own land. Um, this is a charity uh, that was set up with the assistance of a Heritage Lottery Fund grant in 2015 under a National Rethinking Parks Programme project. It's based on the idea of uh, US parks trusts and foundation models. Uh, the idea being to 
help raise funding for public parks and rethinking parks program was about recognizing um, that many local authorities across the country have been struggling to um, find the enough revenue to continue to manage parks to the standard that they would like to um, and that this is a way of generating extra income fundraising tapping into philanthropy to improve our public spaces so when the charity was set up, there are two um, BCP members of staff or Bournemouth at the time of, of nine trustees. Um, as Ian mentioned, I'll be leaving in August, so that, that'll be down to one. But the Articles of Association stipulate that there's two. And the reason that at that time we chose that they would be officers is we felt that it would be really important that the Parks Foundation be seen as politically independent. Um, we looked at models of how uh, the National Trust and the RSPB work and that you see donations from people from across different um, political beliefs um, and we didn't want if we were trying to encourage people to donate to their parks we didn't want it to be associated with any um, or, or politicized in one way or the other so um, that was the the logic behind there being council officers on board and they're chief idea behind that being that, that they would be there to advise other trustees. So the object of the, the trust is to provide and enhance the facilities and equipping of parks and green spaces. And now it's not just within Bournemouth because the Parks Foundation has widened its charitable remit, it's within Bournemouth, Christchurch and Paul for the benefit of the community. Um, and it also aims to advance public education in subjects related to parks and green spaces and provide leisure and recreation facilities and supporting welfare. And you'll find that those objects are remarkably similar to Milton Keynes Parks Trust, um, as they were the, the charitable scheme for Bournemouth Parks Foundation was based on um, the Milton Keynes Parks Trust model. So the, the Parks Foundation could own land in the future, it's just it is not owning uh, land at the moment, it chooses to, um, to concentrate on um, projects to improve social welfare and on fundraising. At the moment. Um, it now employs 10 staff, um, several of those part time, and it's working in partnership with BCP on the Future Parks Accelerator project now funded by the Heritage Fund, National Trust and Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government. Um, that's a £900,000 project to look at. Again, it it's, it's follows on from the Rethinking Parks work to look at ways, uh, new models of managing parks for, for the future. Um, and as I said before, B the Parks Foundation doesn't own land or property, although it works with BCP through a memorandum of understanding um, alongside draft management and lease agreements on a couple of buildings. In terms of parish councils, it's just worth when we're talking about other ways that um, public parks can be held. So parish councils, they have a um, they they will manage the allotments within their parish um, and they may own and manage parks and open spaces. Um, and in terms of a funding model, they may also raise a precept to cover the costs of the management of those spaces. Um, BCP currently manage some parish council owned spaces um, under agreement with the parish but the parish may choose to work with uh, either to manage them directly to contract in those services to work with bcp council or to work with the parks foundation however they wish for those spaces to be managed it's also worth mentioning fields in trust um, so there are a number of sites across BCP that are de designated as that should read King George VI playing fields or Queen Elizabeth II playing fields. Um, and these sites, uh, fields in trust, mean that they've been voluntarily covenanted at some point or other to remain as public open space by the landowner. The most recent one being the QE fields. Um, and there's a number of sites that were designated in QE fields in, in Bournemouth, Paul and Christchurch. Fields in Trust is a national charity that manage this scheme and hold the covenant. So if we were to change um, the use or go into a long lease with an organisation on any of those sites, um, we need the permission of Fields in Trust. So just as a little comparison between some of those trusts, we've got the Lower Central Gardens Trust, Five Parks Trust, Parks Foundation. I've put in Russell Coates Museum here um, and other trusts that we've, we've picked up there. Um, parish councils um, and fields in trust so you can see which ones are landowners, leaseholders, um, 
have a board of trustees, um, have officer representation or member representation, um, are independent from the council and um, produce sets of accounts. So just looking at the Lower Gardens Trust here, this is a summary of the accounts ending March 2020. Um, the accounts ending March 2021 um, aren't available yet. Um, and you can see the income and expenditure. These, these are accounts the council produces from within its own accounts and provides those to the Charity Commission. Um, the donations here on the income are predominantly funds donated by BCP and the Bournemouth bid. So Bournemouth bid, um, that would be about Christmas tree wonderland in the go uh, lower gardens and BCP. It's uh, it's the the revenue budget that we put into to managing that park. Charitable activities within that park. That's mainly the mini golf. Um, and then we've got other trading um, concessions charges. So that would be income from um, cafes or through events and things like that. Um, and the charitable activities on that site are mainly just maintaining the gardens and running it um, and holding events. Five Parks Trust is a little bit different. There's um, you, you've got donations. There are uh, is 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 completely one grant from BCP activity BCP Council, um, and the charitable activities are um, the the sport events, plant nursery, um, and recreation. And the other trading is income from cafes and concessions. Um, and the charitable activities there are maintaining and running the gardens um, or the park um, and the facilities within it. So it's, it's mainly um, a lot of sports facilities within King's Park and the plant nursery. So Parks Foundation, to give you a little idea, the 1920 annual review. Um, so you've got the funds of the charity on the bottom right. So. Um, there's just over £400,000 at the end of the year on the funds of the charity. Um, the 2021 accounts, which are unconfirmed at the moment, but will, are, are currently being prepared for um, external examination, it's that there's an income of 945000 expenditure of 512000 To give you an idea um, what from that um, relates in some way to BCP, so the Parks Foundation has bid for uh, a lot of neighbourhood SIL funds, and that's predominantly to improve playgrounds. Um, they've received a grant from the BH Coastal Lottery, and then in partnership with the council have had a future parks grant of 451. Um, a lot of that money will go through the Parks Foundation, but wh wherever that expenditure on that project is, is spent by BCP Council, it is granted from the Parks Foundation back to BCP so that there's a, a zero out term for BCP for that project. Um, and I can't see, I'll just move something there. The trading income there is around 101,000, 102,000. So over the um, period of the, the Parks Foundation since it was inception in 2014, it's raised about 1.8 million. Okay. Um, in terms of external assurance, um, the charities accounts and annual reports are all submitted annually to the Charity Commission. So if you go to the Charity Commission website, you can find information on trustees, you can find information on accounts, um, whether accounts are sent in on time, all that sort of thing, um, and you can download those accounts. Um, the Lower Gardens Trust and Five Parks Trust, because they're um, larger charities, their annual reports are externally audited, so the council pays for those uh, to be externally audited. The Parks Foundation's accounts haven't yet reached that point, but they're assessed by an external examiner. But once the, they go over a million pounds, I believe they will need to be externally audited. Um, so some other examples of Parks Trusts. Um, so Bristol and Bath Parks Foundation was based on uh, Bournemouth Parks Foundation and indeed we, we work with them to help form Bristol and Bath Parks Foundation as is Parks Alive Cleveland and Redcar again based on Bournemouth Parks Foundation. Urban Green Newcastle is something um, set up almost in parallel at the same time as Bournemouth Parks Foundation with a slightly different approach. Um, Newcastle had had 90% budget cuts to their parks over the last 10 or 15 years and we're in a really desperate situation. They 
uh, went through the process of um, working with the National Trust and putting a million pounds into a project to work out how that they would um, put their parks into trust to safeguard their future. And a number of their parks are now in trust with a tapering grant from the council um, and a charity, Urban Green Newcastle, who managed them on a long term lease. Um, an interesting model there is that the they have an independent board of trustees, but that the, the members of that charity are the um, the main bodies or the, those sort of long standing public bodies in the town. So the water companies, the universities, the council, um, CCG, those sorts of bodies. So that as members, um, they can oversee to ensure that the trustees are um, directing the charity in the um, in the direct in the spirit of um, how it's meant to be delivered. Milton Keynes Park Trust and Neen Park Trust are slightly different. They've been both set up on the basis of, of um, a large endowment fund. So they both own property. So Neen Park Trust is a single park. Um, it owns a hotel, um, conference facilities and restaurants, um, and that the income from that can help run the rest of the park. Milton Keynes Parks Trust has a property portfolio in excess of 200 million um, and the the um, the the funds from that um, each year help fund the management of most of Milton Keynes parks and open spaces. The Royal Parks is a charity that um, was relatively recently set up. It was there was a Royal Parks Foundation and the Royal Parks were sort of set up a bit like a quango. Um, they merged with the foundation in 2017 um, and managed the a, a number of parks across London under um, uh, uh, independent board of trustees with um, three leaders of councils um, within London sitting on that. Torbay Coast and Countryside Trust was uh, to set up 15 or 20 years ago that was set up to manage countryside within um, Torbay so um, but much more of a, a rural setup there managing coast and country parks um, so they predominantly their income comes from um, car parks and, and visitor centres. The National Trust that um, was mentioned earlier on is a membership organisation, um, a lot of free public space, um, but a lot of chargeable public space. So you have to be a member to go and access some of that. And then the Lake District Count, uh, Foundation, similar again to Bournemouth Parks Foundation, was set up um, to help the Lake District um, Park Authority um, bring in additional income from the visitors donations towards help managing the park um, in light of um, reduced government subsidies. So that sort of a bit of an introduction to um, charitable trusts. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have and um, I'll, I'll stop screen sharing now. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Members. Questions? Uh, Councillor Phipps. Okay. Well, there's three lots of, well, three different parks I want to ask questions on. So, should I just start on one um, and then hand it over to somebody else and perhaps come back or something? So, the first one, which you started off first with, was the Lower Central Gardens. Um, and you, you've got a board there of four councillors and others. Yeah. Um, and say it meets quite often. When did it last meet and, and are there any records of, of what happens? Are the, are the minutes or anything like that in, in the public domain? Um, just wondered what happened about, with that. How does that work? So the Lower Gardens Trust hasn't met since we've become BCP, but until we were BCP, it was meeting three times a year. Um, for It's met since 2011, I think up to probably about 2017. The minutes were um, handwritten or taken um, through uh, and, and typed up and put up as PDFs. Um, and since then, they've been recorded at the town hall. So between so probably about 2017, 2019, they were recorded and at the town hall. They they will be on the um, on the council's website. And the reason it hasn't met since 2019 is um, it's around resources um, and organising the, the governance of it. Um, we have a new governance system and we need to um, organise how um, meetings will be convened in the future. Okay, shall I carry on or, or 
I think it'd be better if you can do your questions and then I'll go to. Well, just carry on, yes. Yeah. Okay, Thank you. sorry, it might take a little while. Um, okay, and you, presumably yourself, you're, is that correct? You're the CEO of that one? No, no, I'm, I'm That's the, what it I, says on, on the charities thing. So you're not? No? Oh, no. I, who, so the, who, the, who is then? Oh, your chief executive officer? No? Is you? Is that right? I, I, of the I lower central call, gardens i wouldn't call myself chief executive officer i, I help facilitate the lower okay. so, okay. um, it's all right it's what it says on i had a look on the charity commission thing and i think that's what it okay. says on there to be honest with you okay. so okay fine right so that is the lower gardens one now going into the five parks trust um you say i think you said there were no separate board members on this and then it says on the thing on the presentation that the trustees are bcp council members so how does that work because this is one where it says i think a chief executive officer is a is a, um an officer is it andy andy mcdonald it might I'll, I'll, I'll pull it up on another screen so there's no councillors on this is what i'm trying to get at because okay so Gardens, bournemouth there was and yourself as an, an officer and others on this one there doesn't seem to be a board but there just seems to be what is put down as a chief executive officer but nobody else so how how i'm just trying to get at how does that work okay so for both charities the trustees are all councillors representing BCP, so all of them. Um, in the case of the Lower Gardens Trust, a scheme has been set up by the council and that followed the um, the, the deal with the Merrick Estate. Um, and it was part of that deal with the Merrick Estate that we would set that scheme up. Um, and so a scheme was formed at that time to um, delegate from full council the management or, or the governance of that site to a board of trustees and we set up that scheme similar to the, the Russell Coates scheme that there would be a number of councillors and some um, lay members that would form the board however those in terms of the, the, they don't replace the trustees what they, they do is they make a recommendation to cabinet which goes through to council. So when council, effectively when council vote, that is when decisions are made, but the decision making is delegated um, to that board of trustees. We have never gone through the process of setting something similar up um, for the parks, for the five parks, but where we were to make a decision that would be significant in terms of change for any of those five parks so that wouldn't be for example refurbishing a playground but if we were to do make a significant change to one of those parks um, a decision record would need to be advertised to ensure that all members got to comment on that decision or that all members got to vote on the decision it would need to be clear within that decision that that decision was being made as a charitable trustee as opposed to a member of the council acting on behalf of the council, if you understand. So there is some inconsistency in the, you know, some of those other trusts that I mentioned before, um, they, they have no governance. We don't produce any um, accounts. And if we were to look through every single deed of every single property that BCP council owned, you would find that there's some inconsistency in the management of them it will be a large piece of work to understand all of that. Um, and, and and yes, it has been picked up by this committee and we, we are, we will be working with legal services to look at um, a review of how we govern the charities to bring some consistency to them. Yeah, I think that was my point, that it yeah. doesn't seem very consistent and um, to have all the councillors as trustees. I'm not sure when anything ever came through council to do with this at all. Maybe there were no decisions to be made. This is why I've been around in the new council for um, a couple of years now, like everybody else, and nothing's come through as far as I'm aware. So I just wondered, like, who was 
running it. So presumably it's the CEO, if you see what I mean. Uh, so <laughs> decisions, in, unless they're uh, in, in terms of day to day management of the five parks or the lower gardens trust, we wouldn't generally um, go to the board of trustees to ask to, for example, you know, it would be crazy to ask you if we, we would tell us to cut, to cut the grass um, would be or, or to yeah. pick litter or to, to change a dustbin or something. If we were going to change the character of the gardens or undertake some significant works, it's that where we say, do you know what, something's changing, it's going to be different to how it was before. And at that point, we would go to the Board of Trustees. Yeah. Okay. So it's, okay. I'm not criticising. I'm just saying. Just just looking at audit and governance, which is what we are yeah. here. Um, just looking at you know the inconsistency there, and perhaps something should be done to perhaps make the, a board so that you know it looks in a way more, I suppose, more open and transparent, and it, you know in a, in the same way perhaps as the other one, or look at the whole thing, which is I think what we're here to do. Um, okay. Thank you very much for that. Then going on to Parks Foundation, I think this is. A lot more complicated as far as I'm concerned. Um, I noticed that there are no councillors at all on this one, um, although there were on the lower central gardens, you say all councillors are on the, on the five parts trust. So, and the reason given was it's to be politically independent, but that obviously didn't, doesn't apply to the other two. So yet again, we've got an inconsistency there. So I just wanted to sort of flag that, that up. Um, also, how many trustees are there? There's nine, is there? Because the Charities Commission say there's seven, but anyway, it says nine in the presentation. So, yeah. um, and who, who is sort of in, in charge of it? Have they got like a chief executive officer there on it? So so, so I pick up the first point, first of all, that um, the first point around that, that, yes, the Parks Foundation is very different to the five parks. So the five parks and the Lower Gardens Trust were charitable schemes set up around land that was in the ownership of the council. So the council was required to manage that land charitably. So it's it's that's what it's set up to do. It's to look after that land for the benefit of the people in perpetuity. The Parks Foundation does not own land. It wasn't set up specifically to own land. It was set up to fundraise to improve parks and open spaces within Bournemouth at that time. The object of it being to encourage all residents to get behind their parks and to donate towards them. It was um, a pilot project um, across the country. It was one of the first to be set up under the Rethinking Parks banner. And the idea was to try new ideas to try and solve the problems that local authorities faced around the lack of funding for public parks. And that's not, um, you know, that's across, across the nation. We all face those problems with um, spiralling social care costs that those non-statutory services get squeezed. So that's the position all local authorities found themselves in. It was one of 10 projects that was selected by Nesta, who are an innovation charity and the Heritage Lottery Fund to look at. And it was of those 10 projects, it was one of two that were held up um, in high regard as something that could be nationally replicable. And to give you an idea of some of the other stuff we've done, we're the first place in the country to um, develop outdoor contact list donation units, um, which we now hold a patent on and are selling those to other charities. Um, and the profit of that goes back to BCP's parks through the Parks Foundation. So the idea of that charity was to encourage all people within BCP to donate to their public park. And that was the reason that we wanted to set that up to be politically independent. After looking at how other charities that successfully fundraised made sure that they were seen to be politically independent. That was the reason for it. And the reason for staff being on that was that we were responsible for setting it up in the first place and we wanted to be there to guide other trustees, help them understand our public parks and to help the charity to grow. So that's that's the logic behind why that was set up in a different way. Thank you. Um, I think because of the way it is set up, and I mean, it obviously works very much in hand in glove, or it used to with Bournemouth Council. Now it's going to be Bournemouth Christchurch and Paul. That's sort of changed. I don't see where like 
the, there doesn't seem to be any records of proceedings yet again or minutes or anything like that and that there's like the public scrutiny so how how does that come into it because they are public parks so um i just wondered how that you know com comes about that any public scrutiny at all or whether there should be i mean you know um and just going on to one other item as well is um like accounts and things like that obviously lots of work is done by the parks foundation for the council so how does it work you know between the two organizations with funding because i don't i don't quite quite get it for instance it's mentions on here about the money from the, the lottery for the 700,000 um but a lot of i know that part of it you've explained this to me before for, but part of it is different streams. I think it's six or seven streams to the the money that has come in. Um, one of them is to produce the green infrastructure strategy for this council. So if that money has been obtained by a charity, by the Parks Foundation, and it will be, I presume, BCP doing the work on that strategy. Do they bill the foundation? How, how, how does it work? There seems to be, I don't know how, you know, it's like the conflicts of interest. I don't know if there are, but I'm just trying to get at it. And it doesn't seem very open to me yeah. that anybody knows actually what is going on. And I, I, I think something needs to change within it. I know that's why we're here. And that's why I want to highlight these things. Um, I'm not trying to be critical. I'm just trying to bring up things that people sort of say to me and have occurred to me as well. Thank you. OK, um, so I, I think the first thing that you picked up was um, around you know their public parks and they are and the public part the funding for our public parks comes from BCP uh, parks foundation doesn't own those public parks um, it may make grants towards BCP to improve those public parks but um, the parks foundation isn't a public organization it's a charity and it responds to uh, and works within the guidelines of the charity commission so um, minutes of meetings are not public um, and you know the, the the public information that is required of a charity is on the charity commission's website and it's all up to date and can be downloaded so there's an annual report each year and there's a full set of accounts so all of that is 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 done in the correct way complying with um, the right governance for charitable bodies charities are not the same as local authorities and they have um, you know so for example charities aren't subject to um, freedom of information for example that local authorities are so that there's a difference there and that's why um, those minutes aren't on um, public record i imagine if members of the public ask the foundation for minutes of meetings they, they may provide them it would be up to the uh, manager of the Parts Foundation um, working with the trustees to, to decide whether they disclose all of those to the public. In terms of the funding arrangements for um, the, the Future Parts, there's a, the, the Future Parts grant was that the bid was submitted um, at a time that Bournemouth, Paul and Christchurch were all um, separate local authorities. Um, when the bid was going to be approved, a new authority would exist, which would be BCP Council. So um, at that time, the Parks Foundation submitted the lottery bid. It was a partnership bid between uh, the, the legacy councils and it was successful. And like many projects where partners work together, one partner um, takes a lead on funding. So often we'll work with Dorset Council um, and they might hold the funds for a project um, or we'd work with Dorset Wildlife Trust on a project. So, for example, the Great Heath project was um, that was all the funding for that went through the lottery to Dorset um, Wildlife Trust. And the elements of work that that we did within our respective councils at that time um, was charged back to or, or granted back. So we don't invoice um, necessarily for that because um, it's not a supply of goods or services, it's a provision of a grant. So um, that grant, what we will do is we will spend against a code within BCP Council. So our code for future parks is, is a, within our accounts and all our expenditure on future parks works goes under that code. 
and periodically we will write to the Parks Foundation and say, could we draw on, um, you know, certainly by year end, we need to make sure that's zeroed out. So any expenditure we've occurred, we will let the Parks Foundation know what we're spending. Um, and Jana, who's our project manager, will make sure that that, that money is, um, is fired across to the council to zero it out. And we have shared budgets, you know, we know um, what we're spending and which partners spending what. So um, that's all clear and that's all checked out by the Lottery Heritage Fund um, and we have an account manager who works very closely with us to make sure that the Heritage Lottery Fund's funds are spent in the way that they were intended. Um, we have an excellent record with them. Okay, thanks. I, I will let somebody else have a go now, I think, but I just one final, final thing. At the beginning, I think it was Ian said that we had to get any questions to you, to you. Was it within a couple of weeks or something? I'm not quite, and I missed it. I'm sorry. What was that about? Are you going? I'm, I, I leave BCP Council in mid August. Um, I'm taking up a job with the Royal Park, so um, I'll be leaving. Um, oh, mid-August. sorry. I missed I missed it a little bit. So thank you for that explanation. So if I've got anything in writing we want to get to you, we just do it within the next couple of weeks. That was what he was saying, basically. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Thank you for all your explanations. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Councillor Phipps. Um, uh, later in the meeting, I, I may well have some further questions about the Bournemouth Parks Foundation myself, because I, I share some of your governance questions about that and, and other uh, others that we have. Um, Councillor Filer. Yes, thank, thank you, Michael. It was very clear. And I'm going to start with my fourth point, which was the Parks Foundation. And as, we're, as, as you're in full flow on that, um, I'd also written um, on my piece of paper, why no member representatives? And it seems to me that it goes hand in hand with everything else which does have member representatives on them. If you're raising money for the use in the parks, how that money is spent surely should be going through um, through the other channels, the, the recorded channels coming to the town. Um, you said it was all clear and above board and all done properly. I've absolutely no doubt at all that anything you do is absolutely clear and above board and proper. But it's not, it, it's a little bit opaque. So um, I was really, when, when this Parks Foundation was first mooted and the, the wonderful film was produced for that, um, and it was very exciting, but I sort of haven't heard anything else about it. I thought it might have died a death. Um, so it's not very it's not very there in the public agenda. And you, I assume you're raising. Has there been a good take up for that? Um, and are there many members of the public who are contributing either time or money? So that's my first question. OK, so um, we're working. So one of the reasons we work to set up the Parks Foundation is there's some things that the council's able to fund itself um, through developer contributions or through its own revenue or through borrowing and there's some things that are more difficult for the council to fund. Um, one of those things which we started off with was the Avery within the lower gardens that um, is something that I think in 2003 was was there was a plan to demolish it and there was um bit of public uproar and, and uh, United Taxis work to um, with volunteers to take it on. It's been managed by volunteers since, but the building is um, very tired. It's not something that's easy to fundraise for. Um, it was not something that the council had the money to work towards. And so the Parks Foundation started to work um, to, to raise funds for that. So um, the public put a pound into, we started to test the propensity of the public to be able to want to donate to public parks through that. So we have a talking parrot within the lower gardens that you can put a pound into. That's now changed into a contactless unit. Um, and that generates around £10,000 a year of donations towards the Avery. Um, we hope to be in a position shortly through the Parks Foundation to provide a grant of £300,000 to the council um, to be able to help um, Avery with um, the, the building that's got planning consent for that site. Um, so, yes, it's been quietly getting on with fundraising um, for those projects, um, for other projects. It's been delivering parks in mind in um, Boscombe. Again, looking at uh, working with people with um, mental 
uh, health and well-being issues. Um, so we work with general volunteers, we work with um, referrals, and we tended to do that work um, and target it in our most deprived parks. So um, looking at places like Horseshoe Common, Churchill Gardens, uh, Niverton Gardens, um, in your ward where we suffer from antisocial behaviour. And the idea was that Peter, who is our, who manages that, and that's that's been in, funded entirely through um, charitable donations and grants. It's now into its, I think it's fourth year. Um, so it's secured through the town's fund um, funding for the next couple of years and to bring um, the project through into Kings Park, works with a bunch of volunteers and adds above and beyond the maintenance that the council can provide in those spaces. Um, they provided a grant for Niverton Gardens again for £25,000 for new play equipment that um, I'm trying to remember where the grant came from again, might have been from the um, health trust or something like that um but yeah it's busy this year we should turn over um around nine hundred thousand pounds um it's so for example at winton rec we had a disused um cricket pavilion on the ground floor it had been used as a youth center it was no longer being used um the parks foundation got a grant from talbot village trust to fit it out with a kitchen a grant to provide someone to run the cafe we now have um, a cafe, the toilets are open all the time at Winton Recreation Ground, and that's working its way towards break even now. So the idea of that is to be able to create a base where volunteers um, are, are welcome, that they can facilitate. We've developed partnerships there with Men's Shed, Prama Care. Uh, we're doing outreach work with Nature Tots, so for educating children around the environment in, in Winton. So doing much more stuff in urban areas. So yes, it, it's still busy. It's still doing stuff and and so far every year its turnover has doubled from when it was when it was set up so um you're very welcome to you know i would ask any members that if they wanted to come along to winton and see the work they were doing or they wanted to see the work that we're doing in boscombe with um through parks in mind um are very much welcome that and if we can get the avery finished i'll welcome you all to come to the opening uh, thank, thank you michael and um i think i'll go on to my last question now because it's appropriate the work sounds absolutely fantastic and i know that work's been done in my ward in in a couple of small well in king's park and also in niverton gardens which is a small park and that leads me on to my last question which is well my next question which is we are no longer bournemouth and the work that's being done should this not be looked at now to expand I, i'm sure the pool members who are here probably never heard of some of these little parks and should that work now not be expanded throughout the whole borough especially that that excellent work you're doing with parks in mind um it it seems that this is very parochial and it's a relic of the previous council um i i know you've got some fantastic parks in pool some of which i didn't know existed until i've met other other councillors from Paul, um, and I've been to see one or two of their parks, absolutely amazing. We, we don't necessarily know each other's areas, and I think the particularly those good works that are being done should be expanded. Um, and just just as a rider to that Parks Foundation, it, I had, I'd heard of all these things. I hadn't realised they were being done through the Parks Foundation. I'd heard of Parks in Mind, and I've heard of some of the other things, excellent work. So without a member, it doesn't have to be, most external bodies of the council do have a member who sits on that body and at least can report, or should be reporting back some of these excellent works that are going on because if we don't know about it, we don't know about it. So we're not aware of what, what is happening. So I'd have thought that probably it won't be under well, it won't be under your aegis, but I think it's something that should be looked at to expand throughout the whole of BCP area so could where I, we're wanted. Could um, I interject? Yes, yes, please. So we have. So the Parks, Bournemouth Parks Foundation is no longer called Bournemouth Parks Foundation. It is now called the Parks Foundation. Um, we Last week, we, as Paul Park, um, 
opened uh, its latest playgrounds. We've got a contact list donation unit that's gone into Paul Park. Uh, there's fifty thousand pounds of neighbourhood seal bid for through for Paul Park Railway through the Parks Foundation too, um, and we're operating three pilot parks um, where we're testing new management for public parks. One of those is Alexandra Park in Paul, where we've got an activator working. Similarly, uh, Waterman's Park in Christchurch, along with Winton Recreation Ground in Bournemouth. So we are working um, through this future park project to ensure that there's consistency across the conurbation. Um, I've got one more question and then something else to say. Um, in the beginning, you were talking about, well, I think it was on the on the slide that the open spaces are for the recreation and enjoyment of the public. And over the years, we've also had a list of parks that no one knows where they are. You gave there was a little list of parks that once upon a time were for the enjoyment of the public. Now nobody knows where they were um, and, and you're investigating or someone's investigating. The ch things change. So no one would have dreamt uh, when these parks were set up, and you know, at the beginning, a hundred years ago, that there would be skateboarders or other such things in the parks. Um, who makes the decisions about what's appropriate? How, what, what's the decision making process about, yes, we can allow this, no, we can't allow that. Yes, we can allow traffic in the park on football days, but never any other time. Um, that sort of thing. How is that governance work? How does that governance work? And I will stop there, Michael, but just before I stop and before you answer, I want to say what a fantastic officer you've always been. Uh, I've worked a lot with you. I've sent you into some disgusting places to look at some uh, bushes where some uh, tramps have been living. You've always been so knowledgeable, so even tempered, so imaginative. And I really, I and I'm sure the rest of this committee wish you the very best of luck in your future. And um, what a challenge to be working uh, in, in London. That will be something quite amazing. I wish you the very best of luck. Thank you very much, Councillor Filer. Um, I've forgotten the question now. That's um... too, too much flattery, Michael, too yeah, much flattery. I think so. <laughs> what was it again? Um, about about the governance, oh, who makes decisions, decisions about yes, what's appropriate. I mean, once yeah. sailing sailing your little boat through the Bourne stream was considered a yeah. fantastic. Well, it wouldn't work today, really. I mean, you know. But so, who makes those decisions so, about what's appropriate and what's not? So, in terms of the the charitable objects, they're they're loose enough. You know, we're talking about public recreation, so they tend to stand the test of time. Um, and in terms of the provision of facilities that we provide across parks, they, they tend to be um, guided by um, community um, and by strategy. So we have something that was a long time ago, probably you know 25 years ago, there was something called PPG Planning Policy Guidance Note 17 about assessing needs and opportunities. And it set a standard for the way we would um, design parks or manage for parks in the future. And the idea being that every few years when we were creating a new park strategy, we would look at what we had. Um, we would look what was in good condition, how well used it was and the spatial distribution of those facilities. So, for example, playgrounds as well. Um, we would look at what other people are providing, whether nationally or internationally and what was popular, what are trends, um, what's on the market, and, and we try different things. So we, we start to work out what's popular, what's not popular. Um, in terms of, um, so for each park or, or across the conurbation, we undertake market research. So in terms of visitor surveys or before we undertake any strategy, we're engaging with the community. So our GI strategy is out or green infrastructure strategy is out to consultation at the moment. I think we've had over 500 responses on that. And in that we're asking people, have we got the right spaces in the right spa places across the conurbation? Are they, are we delivering what people want now? So what we delivered when public per parks were um, first designed in the, the, the late 19th century um, was incredibly popular at that time. Is our provision uh, right to create the same levels of enthusiasm now? So we will look at what's out there in the world. We will try and propose ideas in master plans, and we're doing that for Alexandra Park, Winton Recreation Ground, um, um, and and Waterman's Park at the moment. So we have master plans that our landscape architects have designed, and they then, based on uh, visitor surveys, will propose some ideas get some feedback and refine a plan for the park. Um, those 
plans then tend to get adopted either uh, you know by a cabinet member decision um, in the case of the lower gardens master plan we went through that process and the master plan was adopted by um, the trustees the board of trustees for that site so we tend to work on a basis of um, asking community um, coming up with ideas uh, going back with those ideas refining them and then watching you know what works what doesn't work um, and seeing how it works so um, I've always said I've never had an original idea in my life all we do is listen to other people and that the ideas that we put out there for, in terms of public parks and what we put out there for people to enjoy is generally based on listening to an awful lot of um, comments complaints um, and a lot of observation of what's going on in our public parks and in public space across the country uh, vice chair thank you for, um hello michael um first of all uh, um mrs byler councillor byler stole my thunder but good luck for the future um i got two questions um the first one is um regarding uh, decision making how much does the portfolio holder for parks um have to influence the whole gambit that's my first question so the, in, in terms of decision making protocol or I mean we, we've got standing you know a, a set of orders in terms of um, the level of a decision that I'm, I'm entitled to make or or my boss Ian is entitled to make or, or um, director executive director or or portfolio holder or what would go to cabinet so there's the sort of set out um, in the council's procedures around how we make decisions based on um, you know the number of wards they affect or, or the financial size of um you know a, 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 a piece of work um but in terms of I, I would say it's the community that decide what goes in their parks we then present those ideas back to the community we'll then present them back to the portfolio holder so for example our uh, something like our volunteering strategy that we, we've just developed has been developed through talking to volunteers and understanding what they're happy about, what they dislike, um, drafting a volunteer strategy, going back to those people. And then when we've refined it, we'll take it to either to um, our director or to our portfolio holder to adopt it. So I would never sign off um, something like that, um, a strategy like that. If we're looking at building something, generally it will go to, you know, depending on the scale of the decision, either to cabinet um, or the portfolio holder decision. But tend to, from my perspective, um, I'm really it's day to day stuff that um, that I'll make decisions on financially. So that the, you know, in terms of our revenue budget, everything else, any capital um, program works, um, will go through uh, the correct decision making process. Thanks, Michael. Um, the, the other question uh, won't surprise you. Um, I, I've been a member of the Lower Gardens Trust also since VCP has been formed and we still haven't had a meeting. Um, you and I discussed this a few weeks ago and I expected something to have happened in the, in the meantime and nothing has. When are yeah. we going to meet? Um, I've got to talk to Democratic Services about the process that we need to go through to be able to hold a meeting. I, I uh, mistakenly followed the process I followed in Bournemouth, um, and that's not the process that we need to go through now. So I need to have a conversation about how that we go through um, the, 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 the correct process that the council wishes to use for the Lower Gardens Trust. So I have um, I've, I've, I've drafted reports and I'll, I'll talk to Democratic Services, whether it'll be me that continues that or not. Um, I don't know, but you know, we'll we'll work on that to get something scheduled shortly. Thank you, Councillor Uh Thank you, um, Chair. I have a couple of points, if that's okay. Um, it's related to um, the other BCP trusts. Um, that, that's been listed in the presentation. I just wondered if there's anything more you could add to that. And um, just to follow up to that, it would be what will happen when, um, when these spaces have been 
um, found and everything's been sorted? And also after that, going forward with those trusts, will there be will councillor involvement because he's a new and we're not quite sure which bits of land and what? So it's just kind of understanding more of those coming down the pipeline and what engagement uh, mem ward members will have and also members of the public will have. Thank you. So we will have to, you know, I guess looking at the governance of trusts that we've got, so whether that's um, Lower Gardens, Five Parks, Russell Coates, um, whichever charity um, we hold, um, and those those other spaces, we need to do more work. We need to work with legal under legal services. Um, my own thoughts would be that it would seem um, unnecessarily bureaucratic to have numerous trusts with the same objects within the same geography. Um, and in those sorts of instances, you look at charity commission guidance, they, they, they wouldn't encourage two charities to work to the same objects in the same area. Um, and you would consider merging those charities is one possibility to look at. Um, if you look at, so for example, um, the the cost, and I'm not talking about the Parks Foundation here, I'm talking about the, the charities that um, wholly own land. Um, so it's the, the BCP charities. Um, that there's a cost to producing the accounts um, that's met by the public purse. There's also a cost of auditing those accounts that the council has to bear. Um, and it would make sense if they all share the same charitable object to merge those trusts in into one. Um, that's my own opinion um, rather than anything that's come out for, of legal opinion or, or, or that of um, either senior officers or, or, or councillors. Um, it will be a, a piece of work that needs to be undertaken between um, council officers to make recommendations in the future um, to councillors on how we might better manage those trusts more consistently um, and more effectively. So more of the money that that we have as a council um, is spent on improving facilities rather than something like auditing accounts. We need to make sure that um, we're still auditing the accounts, but but perhaps we're not auditing huge numbers of accounts um, at the risk of putting less money into public facilities. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I do uh, no, I do agree with uh, some of what you said, and obviously I don't want to jump the gun until the until that piece of work's been done. But I um, I feel it, if that's the kind of road we go down, then a vessel of what councillors feeding into that um, would would I think benefit because obviously it makes sense having those um, other places put into one trust. I, am, I agree of the efficiency on that. Um, but because of the variety and where they're located, I think there would have to be some other input from other members. Um, just moving on from that, um, just a couple more points. I see under the slide with the other example of Park Trust. Um, I think it's very encouraging what you said, that we're not only um, leading the way um, in how these trusts work, but we're also encouraging other authorities and other authorities are uh, learning from us and want to learn from us. I think that's very positive and I think that shows um, that this very young council has some brilliant officers. And mentioning officers, um, I also want to follow on from Councillor Farrell and Councillor Williams. Um, we've worked, Michael, with projects in my ward um, and I would just like to say thank you very much for all your help and sorry to see you go, but wish you all the best. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Brook. Fine, thank you, Chair. Um, Lower, Lower Central Gardens Trust, there's uh, an adopted master plan which dates from 2011. That means if it hasn't been revised, it's going to be at least 10 years old. Are there any plans to update it? Because it would be normal to update within sort of once every five years. Um, so are there any plans to update it? And if so, what sort of things will be taken into account with regard to that? And secondly, um, there's a management plan which delegates day to day decision making and approved development to BCP officers. Um, can you give us some examples of approved development and shouldn't um, members on the on the board uh, and, lo and the councillors actually be involved at some point in deciding or approving the development. Yeah, yeah. So the the members do. You know, where we 
got approved developments that means we've we've taken it past members of the board so um for example something that wasn't on the master plan uh that we've taken to the lower gardens trust and they've approved is delegated to us to get on with um so for um the example the avery the we, we we worked with and and picnic park deli which is the cafe next door in both instances we work with members we sat down we talked through different designs with them so you know they're all very heavily involved in that process um so yeah and and in terms of looking at the master plan we we work with members throughout that um in terms of the master plan being too old it's um 2010 it takes a long time to um to implement them we're still working on delivering everything from that plan. So when we when we've got through it, uh, if we've got the funds, we will look to to develop more. I think in terms of priority for us at the moment um, across BCP, there are parks without master plans or management plans, and I think Lower Gardens. Um, having a management a master plan 10 years old is better than not having one at all. So um, our priorities at the moment are certainly looking at um, spaces like um, Whitecliff and Beta in Harborside. You know that, that it's really important that we plan properly for those spaces. And when we plan properly, it means it's more likely we're we're going to achieve grants for them. So uh, that master plan was prepared for a, um, a lottery grant um, some years ago. We weren't successful with that grant, but it's allowed us to um, to inform the better development of the gardens. We undertake visitor surveys um, periodically within the lower gardens and what we're finding is that, that we're going in the right direction in terms of satisfaction with um, the facilities that people were less satisfied with in the past, so such as catering, um, where we introduced street food corner or, or, or rebuilt what were um, blue plastic kiosks into Purbeck Stone first green roof buildings in Bournemouth um, within the gardens there. So yeah, members involved in all the design um, all the way through. And, and we work with board councillors on any significant changes to their parks. Um, fine, thank, thank you for that. Just a little bit concerned um, in terms of the master plan being 10 years old. Um, I would have thought that there would be a need to update as, as demands change, as um, conditions around parks change, um, activity requirements change. Surely it ought at least to be looked at in terms of updating them. So Councillor Brook, I would love to, but we don't have the resource. I'm afraid, you know, being honest, I mean, we were talk, talking earlier on about the resources available um, for local authority under the pressure that we're under. Um, we have to prioritise. And if we've got a master plan that we haven't yet completed delivery of, and we're still working on that, um, we, we, have, uh, we work towards a service plan that is signed off by our portfolio holder that directs our work for, for the year ahead. And that's based on a very long list of priorities that are narrowed down to those things that we think um, that we'll be able to financially achieve and that, that will have the biggest impact and are in line with our, our adopted strategy. So, um, and in terms of BCP, we're working on that strategy framework at the moment. So we're we, we've already brought through a playing pitch strategy. We're working on a sports facility strategy. We're working on the GI strategy. Um, all of that that will inform where we best prioritise our time with the resources that we have to make the biggest impact for our communities. OK, fine. Thank you for that. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Brown. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, a couple of questions, Michael. Um, firstly, a couple of questions on Lower Central Gardens Trust. Um, in the presentation, it says about governance is delegated to the Board of Trustees, four councillors and three co-optees. Though on the Charity Commission website, it just shows one trustee of BCP Council. So just to understand that Board of Trustees, they're not properly recognised charity trustees by the Charity Commission. They're just a, a board of... A, a, a sort of membership board that oversees it, but the the one recognised charity trustee is BCP Council. Is that right? Yeah. So the the the, BC, the, the, the council has delegated the management of the trust um, to ensure clarity and separation um, from its business as a local authority. It's set up a board of trustees. It's introduced um, an element, three lay trustees to to 
give balance, but the, the weight of the Board of Trustees is still with the members. Um, and those members will make recommendations, so they don't make decisions, they'll make recommendations to Cabinet and through to full Council. Um, so the, the final decision at the end is made by full Council. So of the of the 70 something trustees um, that we do have, but um, generally the, the decisions that have been made by the Board of Trustees um, have not been challenged by either Cabinet or um, or by Council um, generally because, you know, like I say, we work from a starting base of working with community, working with ward councillors, going back to community, back to councillors and so forth. So by the time we get to making decisions, they've they've been they've been you know pretty well scrutinised. OK, that, that's OK. I'll just I'm just a little concerned, obviously, the way you term it, obviously this board of trustees of seven people make recommendations and then the decision is made by BCB Council. Because I think legally, obviously, if you were if you were on a board of a charity and you were making decisions, then legally you'd be recognised as a proper charity trustee. So I suppose it's just remembering that um, that difference that actually they're not decision makers. They're just yeah. So so yeah. Urban Green Newcastle have, have, have you know have struggled with this as well. And in the end, what they've done is set up Urban Green Newcastle as an independent charity. Um, and that they had they spent a lot of money on 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 legal work getting to the point they did where they put the parks into a trust on a long lease from the council so a separate organization a separate charity where the the the, um, the trustees of that charity are not the councillors but the the council is a member and the members in the end so if you look at the national trust you have um board of trustees but actually the power in the end lies with the members and the members can steer where the charity goes in the end but the day-to-day -day governance is held by the board of trustees and that's that's how they overcame um some of that um the difficulties in the clarity but but it's a, it's a it's a difficulty that any local authority would have where you're you know you've got business as a trustee of a charity but you've also got business as um a local authority and it, it's it's yeah. just it's very important when members are making those decisions that um that we as officers um make it clear to you that in the decision that you're making here you're making it under the um for the objects of the charity and we need to set aside some of our perhaps our um wider objectives as a council doesn't mean they can't work hand in hand but you do have to think of the part first yeah and second one on Lower Central Gardens Trust about the looking at the um, financial figures, um, obviously donations and legacy charitable activities, and then other trading activities. Now, other trading activities is five hundred and fifty nine thousand last year out of one point two three million. So, my calculations, it's just over forty five percent other trading activities, which it lists as other trading cafes, concessions, charges, etc. Um, have has that charity taken professional advice on those trading activities? Because if you, as a charity, if you're doing trading activities, you're exempt from paying corporation tax on those trading activities. But it's quite a complex area, and I've looked into it in the past. And but typically, it's up to about 25% of your um, income can come from trading activities. There's primary trading activities, ancillary trading, non-primary purpose activities, those sorts of things. It's quite a complex area, but the Charity Commission, I think in their guidance, do advise that the trustees take professional advice about whether they would be liable for corporation tax on those trading activities. And at 45%, that surprises me that other trading activities, it's not the same for the five parks, but for Lower Central Gardens Trust, I'm just a bit worried about tax exposure. I'm you're you're going beyond me in terms of finance at the moment. Um, I'm I'm unaware that the Lower Gardens Trust um, it would be exposed to to corporation trucks being under the ownership of a local authority. But I, I don't know whether Adam or um, any other people within our finance team might know any better. Um, but yeah, it's one for us to go away and think about. Uh, Mr. Richards is online, I think. Yeah, we can get yeah, a comment. <laughs> well, you know, local authorities do not pay um, corporation tax. Um, but, you know, clearly when we set up um, companies, 
and there potentially um, would have some corporation tax exposure. You know, in regards to charities, we need to look at the arrangements very carefully um, to ensure that any corporation tax or any kind of um, liabilities um, are kept to an absolute minimum. Um, one other question, then, just a, just a, a general question. Um, a little con obviously, the, the, the primary income for these well, Lower Central Gardens Trust and the Five Parts Trust is from donations and le and legacies, and the primary donation is sort of from BCP Council to to fund what they do. Um, obviously, there's pressure on revenue budgets, and I'm just a bit concerned about the. So exposure of those sort of semi-independent charities to reductions in the council's donation for their work. Um, just thinking back in Borough of Paul before, you know, that um, Upton Country Park was subsidised to, to a fair extent, but then with pressure on revenue budgets, it was looked to them to become as far as possible self-financing and reduce that sort of drain on revenue budgets. I mean, is that a risk for Lower Central Gardens Trust and Five Parks Trust that those areas could be looked at to sort of the, you know, the sort of thing that's been looked at but in other areas is like annual reductions in those sorts of donations and grants and contributions to those to those bodies and what that would mean for the parks so i think i mean when you look at that then that's exactly why uh newcastle have set up a separate entity called urban green newcastle that allows the the, the, the parks trust there um to access funds that local authorities can't fund. I think you do have to go back though a little while. If we go back to the formation of public parks, they weren't, um, they were a response to a public health problem. They were a response to uh, a nation that was suffering from, uh, you know, we weren't fit, we weren't healthy, we didn't take part in sport. Um, and their, their primary purpose wasn't to generate income or be self subsidizing, it was to, 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 to try and offset the, the, the massive cost of sickness, um, of, um, of, of ill health. So if you looked at somewhere um, like Bourneville that Cadbury set up as a, as a philanthropist, he, it wasn't set up for, to, to make people happy. It was set up to improve the productivity of his workforce. Um, same with Port Sunlight um, on, on Birkenhead. So when we look at the the social value of our parks that's where we need to to really concentrate so we've had some work undertaken by a company called vivid economics looking at the natural capital value of our parks that we estimate to be about for the five million that we put in a year around 230 million in um benefits to the community mainly around mental and physical health and i think yes we can work to reduce the ongoing subsidy of parks but we have to keep an eye on the benefit that parks give us and how that for every 50,000 visits we generate to the parks, we think we can create around a million pounds of social value. And when 60% of the council's budget is spent on those escalating social costs, um, and that's let alone the, the, the costs for, for the NHS, um, it's really important that we understand why we produce parks in the first place and the social value that those spaces can bring. Um, Yes, we, we could probably reduce um, the subsidy, but we need to make sure that we don't further erode the quality and therefore reduce visitor numbers, increase antisocial behaviour and the issues that go with them. Um, and I think really in order to be able to do that, we've got to challenge ourselves and say how most effectively if the council doesn't have more money for um, public parks, which is, is understandable, what would be the best way to increase those uh, the, the the income and the effort that goes into those parks to continue to improve them, um, and and that's um, that's why we're part of what's called the Future Parks Accelerator. It's some of the challenges we're looking at with um, eight other local authorities across the country and with National Trust, MHCLG, and um, and the Heritage Lottery Fund. So um, yeah, difficult problem, um, but. Yeah, and, and, and we work every year to try and improve uh, our revenue position, improve our income, uh, but we've always got a mind on social fairness and making sure that we have space available to everybody, um, no matter how much money they've got or where they live within the conurbation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Mr Rowland. Um, I did say earlier on that I had a question. We're running very short on time. 
Uh, I have a question and then I have um, something I think the, the committee will support uh, in terms of going forward. My question comes back to, I think, uh, the, the issue raised right at the beginning by Councillor Fitz, which is the uh, review of governance uh, to make it uh, transparent and um, more consistent, because that's coming across to me in responses as being quite a key issue uh, in terms of the presentation. And most particularly, the issue of the uh, Bournemouth Parks Foundation, now the Parks Foundation. Um, and what I still don't quite understand, I think, uh, is the issue of the related income uh, provided by BCP Council, for which there is no uh, dem democratic representation. And that's the piece that really bothers me in terms of governance. Now, I'm not saying whether that's right or wrong, and it may be very fully justified. But when I see in there that, uh, for example, neighbourhood um, uh, sill of 151,000, um, and um, ask myself, as I'm sure other members have, uh, members have a responsibility uh, around governance issues. And we're bringing together tonight those so that we can actually understand them better. Um, so what I'd like to ask is that given that part of this came from uh, the chairman of the Overview and Scrutiny Board in terms of asking me about the governance issues around, around parks in general, um, and I suspect that actually, if, if we don't ask for this, the Overview and Scrutiny Board will ask for it anyway, so the work will have to be done one way or another. I wonder if we could seize the initiative tonight to um, ask the monitoring officer to look at the consistency of these governance arrangements <laughs> to make sure that they are actually fit for purpose, because BCP, having been up, up and running for two years now, we are reviewing many issues and governance is very high on those reviews. And um, to, to ask her to do that, um, I don't think it's a massive piece of work, actually, but it would be very good if it had your input before you leave the authority, because I fully recognise that you are the man with the greatest knowledge on all of these issues, and you will have an understanding of why we are doing it the way that we are, or how we might improve some of those. So what I think with the um, support of the committee, I'd like to ask is for that to be undertaken uh, as, as a matter of relative urgency in the short time uh, that you will still be with us. Um, and so we can then share with the Overview and Scrutiny Board uh, the outcome of that, uh, because I think members don't understand these issues quite as thoroughly uh, as we should. I certainly didn't until I heard your presentation. I expect that applies to others as well, judging by the questions. Uh, and we'd really value uh, if that could be taken forward uh, and for the monitoring officer to find in legal uh, services an appropriate officer to work with you on uh, preparing uh, that joint report for us and for overview and scrutiny. So I think in terms of a recommendation, I think I've got looking around the room without formalising it, I think I've probably got support from members across the committee for that work to be undertaken or to be requested. Uh, and I see that uh, Ms. Sice is online with us. I wonder whether Ms. Sice, you could just make a brief response to that suggestion. Yes, certainly, Chairman. We'd be happy to pick that up. And I think there have been some discussions between uh, Sean in my team and Michael already around this area. And we'll just broaden that out and make sure that a report comes back to you. Thank you very much indeed, Ms. Sice. Very much appreciated. Uh, before we uh, close the uh, formal business of this meeting, could I just um, echo what has been said by other members um, across the room uh, to uh, thank you for the work that you've done over many years. Uh, and I've, I think, worked with you during most of those in former Bournemouth Council and more latterly BCP Council. Um, you are a, an extremely fine uh, representative uh, as an officer of the part 
of the authorities' work that you have overseen for so very, very long, and you will be missed. I've got absolutely no doubt about that whatsoever. I know how many times I, and I'm sure many other members, have called on you to help deal with difficult circumstances, and you've always risen to the challenge and uh, almost always managed to solve the problem. Uh, so could I thank you for that? Uh, on behalf of all the committee, uh, and to wish you all the very best in the future with the with the Royal Parks. I'm sure that it's going to be a very challenging role that you'll be taking up, um, and um, we we know that uh, their gain is definitely our loss. But um, I'm sure that you'll do well in the future, and we wish you all the very best. And uh, thank you for all you've done in the past. Um, Members, um, I will therefore close this formal part of the meeting at uh, 7.35.